everyone, and welcome to our morning worship service. Just a few announcements to go over. Uh, some of the announcements that are already in the bulletin sheet. Please take note of what is in the bulletin sheet. I know some people take them, fold them, and simply put them in the pew in front of them. Uh, but we want you to take them home with you and to read them and even to pray through some of the things that are in our bulletin sheets weekly. Last week, the Union Commission, uh, that is the body within the wider church, that uh, looks after appointments uh, within the church, uh, appointments not only of ministers, uh, but of deaconesses as well, uh, under their heading, and uh, also for something called APPs. Okay, what's an APP? An APP is additional pastoral personnel, uh, which a youth and family worker would have come under. And uh, they have given us the permission to go ahead and employ a youth and family worker. And we now need to enter the process of advertising and interviewing for this post. Now that the decision has been taken to employ a youth and family worker, anyone who wishes to start contributing to the costs of this project can do so as follows. And you have them set out within our bulletin sheet today. They can set up a standing order and the forms available in the porch or from Richard uh, Rutherford, our treasurer, or they can donate by the offering plate. And you can use an ordinary envelope as long as you mark it clearly, youth and family worker, along with your envelope number and the amount within. We really praise God for uh, this appointment, and we trust that we will know the Lord's leading and guiding in the days ahead through this process of advertising and interviewing. This evening we are uh, holding our evening service at 6.30 p.m. as usual, and tonight is going to be a special service as we look at the 23rd Psalm, uh, this psalm that most of us will know, at least know at least the very beginning of it, the Lord is my Oh dear, you're half asleep already and it's only 25 too. The Lord is my shepherd. Amen. And we're going to be looking at what this psalm means to us as we come and worship God this evening. And the choir will be singing some special pieces and around its theme. And there will be some readings and then I will just bring a word, uh, strangely enough, based on Psalm 23. During our service this morning, uh, Kathy Craig, this, is, this will be her last official service with us. Huh? Uh, depend on, okay, no, and Kathy's going to come and give a, a brief report about her year with us and her hopes and plans, maybe. And uh, we're going to bring a commissioning prayer upon her through some of our elders uh, and make a small presentation. Let's come and worship God. We do so as we sing seated two pieces. Father God, I give all thanks and praise to you, and I stand before the presence of the Lord. We remain seated for these pieces.
think I have a verse to come up on, on PowerPoint. Um, what, what do we give? What is the most precious thing uh, we possess? Uh, we'll be looking at this in a few minutes with the children. What is your most precious possession? I, I want you to think about that uh, as, as moms and dads and, and adults and friends. What is your most precious possession? What would you not give away at any cost? What is the thing that you hold most dear to you? Uh, one writer says this, that which you hold most dear is that which captivates your heart. And whenever you look behind those things that are most precious to you, then often that shows your heart. In this verse, Mary, who knew the preciousness of Jesus, gave away something that was very precious to her and would have been precious in any first century household. This pint of nard, this fragrant smelling perfume whose odor permeated the whole of the house when she broke open that jar and as she poured it on the feet of Jesus, its fragrance would have been so strong and powerful that instantly every room would have smelt of this sweet-smelling perfume. <coughs> Judas, his reaction to this was totally different, and we'll be talking to the kids about that. But for her, the most precious thing she was willing to give to say thank you to Jesus. What a powerful illustration of what is precious and what we need to give as we come, even in worship this morning. Do we engage ourselves in worship or do we just go through the motions? Oh, I don't know that one. Don't like that hymn. Oh, that's a bit... Oh. Or do we just come with everything that we are and have and we say, Lord, I am here to worship you. It doesn't matter about me and what I feel. It's about you. For that is true worship. And we give our all. Let us come and worship him. Let's do so. As we stand when we sing, praise ye the Lord. God's praise within. Let us unite our hearts in prayer. Let us all pray. Father, this morning we have been singing the words of this psalm, this psalm that talk of praising you, praising you within your sanctuary, praising you with our hearts and our minds and everything that we have to engage in our worship of you. 
Lord, we ask that as we come and as we gather and as we bow in your presence that we would give the very most precious things in our hearts so that we might come and worship you in spirit and in truth that we would set aside those things that we hold as precious sometimes, but that simply distract ourselves from our worship of you. And Father God, we bow in your presence this day to bring you glory, bring you praise, bring you our hearts, bring you our plans, bring you our ambitions bring you everything that we are so that we can worship in spirit and in truth. And Lord, we ask that you would speak to our hearts today in terms of what we give you and in the manner that we give, that we would give unselfishly, that we would give joyfully, that we would sow into our lives those patterns that bring about glory and honor and praise to you and to you alone. And Lord, therefore, we ask that the very Holy Spirit of God would descend upon our service of worship this day. And that same Holy Spirit would speak into the hearts of every person gathered here, You would show us of our need of you as our Father in heaven, of our need of a Savior in Jesus Christ our Lord, of our need to follow him and worship him and hold him in our hearts as our Savior when we come in repentance and trust and faith in him. That we would know as the Lord's people here that we keep short accounts with you, And that Jesus has dealt with our sin forever. And guilt is not to rule our minds and our hearts. But Lord, we are set free to serve you and be your people in this place and in this community, in the church family of Greystone Road. And so, Lord, lead our worship, we ask, in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is 2 Corinthians chapter 9, and Amy is going to come and read God's word for us. Thank you, Amy. Uh, This can be found on page 1163 of the Pew Bible. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Thank you, Amy. We continue our worship of God. Your offering will be received.
Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness and your blessings to us. Father, we come and we give joyfully and graciously these are gifts to you, that we might be generous givers because we know of the grace that we have received in Jesus Christ our Savior. Take these our gifts in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, boys and girls, if you want to come up to the front, we'll have our children's address. Okay, right, let's go. Okay, now I asked this question at the uh, uh, beginning. Um, what is your most precious possession? Has anybody got uh, an answer to that? What is your most precious possession? Okay, anybody? Right, okay. Oh, oh. Okay. iPad. iPad? <laughs> All right. Somebody else here? I saw a hand up. My mom. Your mom. Oh. Okay. What she give her? Okay. Oh. Okay. Right. Okay. Anybody else? You can't beat that one, can you? Really? Well, maybe one or two, but right. Anybody else? Okay. Right, I have a couple of precious possessions. I would have had three, but one of them's away this weekend with the party that they belong to. Okay, Ruth isn't here. She's away gallivanting again. Uh, so uh, she has taken her most precious possession with her. But I have another couple because there's two other, two other children in our house. Okay. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll give you, I'll, I brought them with me. These are their most precious possessions. Okay. Okay. All right. Now, anybody know who this might be? Yeah. Uh, Ian's. Ah. <laughs> 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 uh. Well, no, no, this doesn't belong to Ian, unfortunately. You should see his. You wouldn't even bring his in. It's that plucked to death. Okay. Uh, but anybody know what the character is meant to be? Anybody know who this might be out of Beatrix Potter? Who? No, no, no. No, it doesn't Ruth. Who is it? Who is this? Jemima Puddle Duck. Go and read her Beatrix Potter, would you? Right? Okay, now this is very precious because, where's Hannah? Oh, is this all embarrassed? Who did what? Your granny knitted the shawl and the hat, and then a very good friend of ours knitted Miss Puddle Duck. Okay, so that is very, she wouldn't give it away for anything in the world, would you? Okay, except maybe an eye pant. Ah. <laughs> all right, so. Ah, it's very, very precious. Okay. Now, something else here. Okay. This is easier to guess whose this might be. <laughs> hey, you should be, you should be cheering them because they're playing that bad this year. <laughs> okay. And and look, it has. Yay! Okay. But you know, I mean, this is an old shirt. Why do you think, what do you think makes it so precious? I mean, I haven't got the photograph to go with this, but if you had the photograph, you would see it. Can anybody see a bit of a scrawl, a dirty markup there? Um, 
Anybody guess? It's a signature. It's a signature. Okay. Now, I don't think anybody could really... Uh, who signed it, Ian? The one and only David Beckham. <laughs> okay, David Beckham and Ian got his pictures. And you wouldn't let this go for all the money in the world? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> okay. All right, so if you see this on eBay, uh, there might be a price. We had that verse at the beginning of the service. Mary took an expensive pint of nard, this incredible perfume, and, and she broke this perfume. And do you ever get a really, really strong smell sometimes? And it just hits your nose and you, it brings you alive sometimes. And, and this was like this perfume in this house that day. Whenever she poured it on Jesus' feet, and then she took her hair. She had long hair, just like some of you girls. And she dried his feet with her hair. People just couldn't understand this. But the thing was, Mary understood that, that in the next few days, Jesus was going to die. And Jesus was so, so, so precious to her that she gave the most precious thing that she had to tell him she loved him. And Judas sat there, Judas... Judas just looked on, and I'm sure in his mind he went, you stupid, stupid person. That pint of nard is worth thousands of pounds. You could have fed hundreds of people for weeks with that perfume. It's that expensive. And he just couldn't see how precious Jesus was to Mary. And boys and girls, it's incredibly important that whenever we see Jesus, we see him as the most precious thing that we could ever possess in our hearts. He is the most precious thing that God gives us. He is the one that we need to take in our hearts and bring glory and honor and praise. Let's close our eyes and let's pray together. Dear God, we want to thank you that you love us and in your eyes, we are so precious that you gave your son for us. We are precious to you. And so precious, you gave us your most prized possession in heaven, your son, to die for us. Thank you, God, for your love for us in Jesus. Thank you that we can know Jesus in our hearts and that we can live for him. Help us to give all that we can to show him how precious he is to us. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to sing our praise together, and it is for God so loved the world that fits in so well.
Okay, thank you, boys and girls. Away you go to prime time. Um, oh, hello. <laughs> Johnny asked me um, just to share really briefly um, about what I've been getting up to um, this year. Um, so first of all, um, at the start of the year, um, we decided to start up the youth club again. Um, so in September last year, we opened Switch, which was our new junior youth club at that stage for children between the age of P7, or P4 and P7. Um, last year, we had some great fun, and we had loads of brilliant volunteers, and the children really, really enjoyed themselves. We were sort of averaging about 40, 50 um, an evening. Um, this year, on Friday night, we had 81. <laughs> And we were very shocked as they came through the door. Um, but I guess it's been really, really encouraging um, for Gillian and myself um, to just welcome so many children who are so happy um, to be in the church um, and who are so happy to get involved um, with their Christian leaders. Um, we have an opportunity during Switch each evening um, to share a little bit of God's word. Um, so it has been really, really encouraging to, encouraging, um, to hear the children slowly um, relax um, and really enjoy um, listening to what um, their leaders have to tell them about God. Um, I've also been helping John as well in youth fellowship, um, either helping or hindering him, I don't know. <laughs> um, I've been helping John out um, with youth fellowship on Sunday evenings as well. Um, we've been getting a good core group of young people along um, and it's been really lovely to see them growing um, and growing with each other um, and encouraging each other and to see the older ones um, helping out the younger ones and um, explaining little bits to them and helping them um, just to settle in and have lots of fun. Um, so that has been really encouraging too and the programme for this year and um, this term is actually looking really good too and we, we start it off um, with a new visitor um, this evening. Um, so it would be really great um, if you could continue um, to pray for some of the work in the organisations um, that I've been involved in this year. Um, I also had the opportunity to go to Romania as well this year um, with Leanne and Kelly and Andrew and Gillian. Um, and I won't bore you too much with it right now because we'll be talking a little bit about it uh, next um, Sunday morning. Um, but it was fantastic too. Um, I had the opportunity with Greystone to go out um, many years ago when I was 15 um, and it was just so lovely to be able um, to return to Romania although we were seeing different people and um, the warmth um, of their friendship um, of the Romanian people was still really strong and um, so we thank God for that too um, and I guess on an enjoyment level I think I've just enjoyed everything jolly um, it's just been so good to serve, I guess, in my home church. And I think Greystone will always be home as well. Um, so you haven't got rid of me that easily. Sorry. Um, so, yes, I just want to thank everybody um, for just being so lovely. Um, I know you haven't even gone out of your way to be lovely. You're just lovely by nature. Um, so thank you so much for that. Um, thank you for your prayers as well. And thank you um, just for coming up and saying all the best um, for this week or things like that. Um, it's something that I've been able to go away to other places and tell, oh, I love my church in Greystone because they just love me so much. Um, so thank you for that. Um, and I really encourage you to keep 
um, going with the youth and children's work that's in this church, um, with all the organisations from Primetime and CE and GB and BB, the work that's put in um, during the week, not only on a Sunday, is absolutely phenomenal. Um, the preparations that go into that are immense. Um, so thank you for that um, and continue to keep going um, and welcome uh, the new youth and family worker um, whenever that may be um, with open arms because I'm sure they'll do um, wonderful work, work for Greystone. So thank you Johnny and thank you Session 2 for giving me the opportunity actually just to come um, and serve in this capacity um, in my home church. So thank you. Okay, right, don't go yet. Okay. Um, we've a couple of things. Well, uh, you start officially on Tuesday, is it? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Start but you're coming back next Sunday to Greystone Road. <laughs> I'm back next Sunday. I told you, you can't get rid of me. Uh, back next Sunday to do the um, CEF service and report back on our time in Romania. Okay. Claire Bain is going to be coming next Sunday morning mm -hmm. and just sharing a bit about her work in CEF. <laughs> and we're taking that opportunity then for our Romanian team just to report. And uh, Kathy is obviously a part of that, so thank you. Uh, could you just, uh, uh, in a couple of sentences, share what you'll be doing in Low Memorial Presbyterian? <laughs> Where is Low Memorial? Uh, and uh, is that Port Line, around Port Rush somewhere? Um, I wish. Uh, <laughs> No. Um, Low Memorial is, uh, is a Presbyterian church um, and it's in Finnegan, which is like South Belfast, between South Belfast and Dunmurray. Um, if you don't know where that is, um, it's near Magro. Um, everybody seems to know where Magro is. <laughs> So um, I will be um, based there and my title um, for uh, my time there will be Youth and Evangelism Associate, which sounds really fancy, um, but basically I'll be working with the young people that are currently within the congregation and um, building them up and encouraging them to go out um, and evangelise to their peers and also seek to bring other young people into the congregation um, and fill the gaps that they have in, within their youth. Okay. Thank you. Um, do you want to come and stand right in the middle here? Some elders are going to come and pray with you because we're very aware that this is, this is a ministry into which Kathy is going to, to come and, and work in, in Low Memorial. Uh, and therefore, in that sense, we want to commission her uh, in prayer before the Lord uh, that she will know God's blessing and God's leading and God's care and God's guidance as she goes as God's servant into this, this role. So could I invite the elders who are going to come and, and pray with Kathy to come and, and pray with her and commission her uh, to, to this work um, in the days ahead. So. Uh, can we just pray? In John 15, verse 5, Jesus says, He that remains in me, and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Heavenly Father, we claim this promise for Kathy. May her future ministry be blessed by you and bear much fruit. We thank you for Kathy's ministry here in this church and the desire that you have given her to work with young people. May Kathy continue to know your guiding her in this new chapter of her life. Her, give her your what she does. Father, we thank you. 
blessings. Your love for her is constant. <coughs> you care about her and you know the desires of her heart. Mm. You are as close as breathing. Let this journey inspire her to express her thoughts, to recover her prayers, restore her soul and to rejoice in your blessings. Help her to be strong in you, Lord, and know by faith that your loving presence is always with her. And we pray, Lord, that you will guide her along the best pathway for her life. You will advise her and watch over her. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Okay. Um, Kathy, on behalf of the congregation, I would like to thank you for the hard work and dedicated service that you have given, not only in your internship year, but as a faithful member of Greystone Road Congregation. You have been involved in, as you have said, in the Youth Fellowship, Primetime, Audiovisual Team, Switch Junior Youth Club, leading the team to Romania, not forgetting your valiant efforts at teaching us actions to new choruses. And I think maybe you failed in, <laughs> in trying to teach me the actions. But <laughs> We're delighted that you have been successful in your recent job application to Lowe Memorial and know that they have made a very good choice in you as their youth worker, youth evangelist. God has blessed you with a, a lovely, warm personality and your cheerfulness and enthusiasm is, are infectious. This has been a great blessing to us in Greystone Road and will continue to be a great asset in working with young people in Lowe Memorial. Kathy, we will miss you, and we want you to keep us informed so that your church family, we can pray for you as you embark on this exciting new chapter of your life. I am delighted on behalf of your church family to present you with this study Bible, which we hope you will find very useful in your new role. We do indeed wish you every blessing in these days to come. And uh, we know the Lord will bless you because he has gifted you so greatly. And uh, we just know that uh, Lo will, will hold you very quickly precious to their hearts in these days to come. Thank you, Kathy. The choir going to sing when I survey.
you. We're going to sing together, Who, O Lord, could save themselves? hope you've been finding this series on the grace of giving uh, helpful over these past uh, number of weeks. One of the things that has struck me in regard to this series on the grace of giving is that it dovetails nicely into some of the services we've been having and some of the services the, we will have in the days to come. Last week we had our CAP service and in a fortnight's time, a few weeks, uh, we will be uh, having our harvest services. And for today, I want to look at a bit at the harvest as we have read a bit about it in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. And it's this theme of harvest that we want to connect in with this Grace of Giving series. Uh, for Christian giving is to resemble uh, a harvest. Paul uh, begins this chapter, if you have your Bibles there, then please open them up at 2 Corinthians and chapter 9, and uh, let's have a look at this, uh, this passage together. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verses 6 to 15. Amy read for us from verses 6 to 8, which is probably the verses that we'll spend most of our time in uh, this morning. Let's read this first word of 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 6. Remember. Remember this. In other words, he is saying, listen intently and take careful note of this, that a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the farmer who plants generously will get a generous crop. The thing we need to bear in mind is as we read this passage it is that farming in the time of first century uh, Christianity was very different from today nearly 2,000 years ago. And indeed it hasn't been until really 100 years ago or even less has farming undergone a total uh, revolution. Indeed even in some of our childhoods Farming has changed drastically. 
Uh, really since World War II, only since then have we known high intensive farming techniques that has changed farming. Uh, for instance, let me do a little survey here. Whoever went potato gathering? Hands up. Okay, so you're showing your age. <laughs> you are. Um, who, who did a full day's potato gathering? A full day's potato gathering. Yeah, you see? Okay, not just out the back somewhere. <laughs> digging out of a pot. Now, come on, that's not potato gathering. See, now it's intensive, isn't it? They have a machine that lifts and cuts and cleans and puts it into the big wooden crate, ready for storage for six months, I don't know how long, and then they'll wash them, wash them. Do you remember the dirty bags of potatoes you used to get and you used to think, I bet you they just put more soil in there. <laughs> so I pay more and they put less buds in it. But now you get lovely, clean, white potatoes. Intensive farming has changed even the way that we eat. Take this picture, for example. Uh, even I can remember speaking to farmers who can recall going out to mow the grass for hay armed with a scythe. Okay, and if you do it with a scythe, come on, be honest. All right. Oh, one. Okay, William. Oh, you're very honest, Brian. Andy. Okay, fantastic. And and you, the the the, the arm, the getting into the rhythm of the scythe and the grass, uh, the stopping and getting the old sharpening stone. Do you remember the old sharpening stone? Yeah. Okay, the hand sickle. Oh boy, you know you'll go home and talk about this over lunchtime now. Oh, you don't know what it was like in my day. <laughs> and all of this. Times have changed. Times have changed whenever hay used to be moved around on the back of a, a horse and cart in the yards. How they were built into stooks for fodder for cattle that were housed over the winter time. In fact, I still remember uh, being on holiday as a boy, seeing those uh, same uh, stooks sitting at the side of the field, uh, ready to be worked on. Gone are those days. Those days are gone. And in fact, if you farmed like that today, you could not live. You just could not live. Farming has changed so dramatically. Right from the cutting to the moment it is placed in the silage clamp, it is never touched anymore by human hand. In Paul's day, when he wrote these words at the beginning of chapter 9, farming was, was incredibly different. Uh, they, 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 they were wealthy enough in those days, even to have had some animals for milk and, and meat production. Uh, the thing to remember here is that most people would have been very familiar with the land. And, and in fact, even today, most of us are still familiar with the land. And we're only removed one or two generations from the farming communities that, that populated the whole of this island. Maybe our grandfathers were farmers. Maybe, maybe even our fathers, maybe even we, are still farming. But Paul employs this imagery here in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 that keys straight into the mind of the reader in the Corinthian church. Even the church in Corinth was, was a highly developed society, but they were still not so far removed from the land that they didn't instantly know what he was talking about. And so we're going to be looking at a few um, uh, points this morning and the first of these principles is that we reap what we sow you reap what you sow whatever whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly and in this imagery sowing is an obvious picture of giving but the obvious question that now arises is this what can we expect to reap first let me say that we do not interpret Paul's words in this way that this is not about the more you give, the more you'll get back. 
The more money you give, the more money you will get. No, that's not what this is about. Verse 7, it says that each person should give what they have decided in their heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Now here, we need to realize something. God doesn't like reluctant giving. He doesn't want an unhappy giver. The Lord loves who? A cheerful giver. Therefore, if we are not giving out of a cheerful heart and out of a heart of joy for what God has given us and for what Jesus has done in the cross, then you know what? God doesn't want our money. If we give grudgingly, then we're better not giving at all. Because if we give grudgingly, then we're giving out of a different motive than what Scripture tells us that we should be giving for. We're giving because we believe that we're earning something, that we're achieving something in ourselves. But when we give out of cheerfulness of our own heart, then we realize that there is nothing that we can give that will make God happier or less happy. We just give because we have a joyful heart and we want to give. The church, the kingdom of God, cannot be built on begrudged giving. It will not be built on begrudged giving. It is built on God glorifying, God honoring giving. And God wants us primarily to discover the joy of giving in this way out of a full heart of thanksgiving to him and for what he has done for us. Let's just pause there. For we see in 1 Corinthians 16 verses 1 to 3. Let's turn over on our Bibles if you've got it there. 1 Corinthians chapter 16 verse 1 to 3. Now how about the collection for God's people? Do what I told the Galatian churches to do on the first day of every week. Each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with his income, saving it up so that when I come no collections have to be made. Then when I arrive I will give letters of introduction to the men you approve and send them with your gift to Jerusalem. This is the giving, the helping of the Christians that were in dire need. And do you notice here a sum of money in keeping with his income? In other words, not only as they have decided in their hearts, but there is that principle here of giving a proportion. And we know from the Old Testament that the proportion that is suggested is a tithe. Through this, we are once again reminded by Paul of the importance of each one of us deciding what we should give. And in the church today, it's rarely necessary to give on the spare of the moment. We, we don't suddenly need to put our hand in our pocket. Very rarely do we do that. Although sometimes there are places to do that. And I'll talk about that at a different time. But how much better is it for us to take time, to take stock, to go and pray, to go and ask the Lord how much we should give so that we might seek a settled conviction about what we should be giving. So now, if we give in this kind of spirit, what will happen? What harvest will we expect to reap? Verse 8 tells us here, look back at chapter 9 and verse 8, and God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Because your opportunities for further service will increase. One writer, a guy called Simon Kistemacher, says, God's greatest desire to give is to give. When man follows God's example, he receives a divine blessing because he demonstrates that he is a follower of God. He is one of God's children. And finally, the second harvest principle applied to us today is what we reap has a double purpose. 
We reap uh, is both one. Uh, what you reap in a field is so that you can eat from it, but it is also for further sowing. The God of the harvest is concerned not only to alleviate our present hunger, the needs of the people, but he is also concerned about making provision for the future. Therefore, God supplies both bread for food, the immediate needs of people, but also more seed for the sower to plant for the generation to come, for the next year's harvest. So we as a congregation not only plan to bring in stuff that we need to run the congregation, to, to give money, to service what we do and what we are, what we have every week, but also to look forward to the days to come. Not that we don't put it into, into any use, but we make it useful unto the Lord's work in the days to come. In the same way, God will supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. Verse 10 says this. Now he, look down here, now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. And it means that it is God who supplies us with all resources. It is he and in his name we do this. It is God who gives us resources to use and invest for him. And Paul uses this continuing farming illustration, this illustration of seed to explain that the resources God gives us are not hidden, foolishly devoured, or thrown away, but just like the farmer, the resources which God supplies us are to be cultivated in order to produce an even greater harvest of righteousness for God's kingdom. When we invest what God has given us in his work, he will provide us with even more to give to his service. Do we understand this principle? The more that we use what God has given us to do his work, the more he will give us to use in his work. So the more we progress as a congregation, then the more will God will give us to grow as a congregation. Maybe not numerically, but spiritually. Yes, that is guaranteed. That is why we progress. That is why we move. It's not keeping worship services the same. It's not keeping our programs that we do with young people the same. It's not the programs that we do every year. It's not just the same. Each year we try and progress and we as a Kirk Session seek to have a vision that God will progress the spiritual work in this congregation. We are never to stay the same. We are always to change. We are always to progress. Now being Presbyterian, that means progression can be quite slow. But I think that is a good thing sometimes. Because sometimes, sadly, you look outside and people seem to explode. And this is fantastic. There's new church. There's new group. group. And two years later you come back and you see division and fraction and broken hearts. And people spiritually are nowhere. So while we may not be the hare, let's be a little bit quicker than the tortoise. And let's see God's kingdom grow in this place. And let's see God's kingdom progress. And if God blesses us numerically, then, well, we can buy a couple of fields out the back here, beyond Rathbeg roundabout. But if not... Let's grow spiritually at the very least. Because God has given us the seed of the word of God as all that we need to grow. We cannot stay the same. We've got to change. And giving graciously as the Lord lays in our hearts what we are to give. Giving joyfully out of what the Lord has given us as a part of the harvest of our hearts and our minds to give with joy in our minds. 
then his work will grow. Now, money is not the key here. Well, if we don't give, then we won't grow. No, that's not what it's about. It's part of living as the Lord's people in this place and living obediently to him. That will make us grow. And that will mean the harvest will be even greater in the days to come. And I look forward to that day. You know the greatest, you know the greatest joy as a minister? You know the ultimate joy as a minister? It's not to see more families on the books. It's not. It's to see people come to the Lord Jesus. That's simply the call. Is to see people come to the Lord Jesus. And that is the mark of the spiritual growth of people in the congregation. May we know joyful giving. May we know the joy of the Lord in our hearts. And may we live obedient to know that joy. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. Thank you for the grace of giving. Thank you that, Lord, we can never give, never give the way you've given to us. Because you gave the most precious possession in all of heaven and the universe. That was Jesus. Jesus, our Savior and our Lord. And so as a church, we seek to reflect what you have given for us. And that is our hearts to Jesus, our will to Jesus, our mind to Jesus, everything that we have to bring glory to you. Help us to give out of joyful hearts that reflect Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> We're going to sing together our closing praise. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Please remember we have tea and coffee after the service. Please stay if you can and then share some fellowship. And can I encourage people that as they go down for tea and coffee, not just to speak to the same people that they always speak to in the same place in the hall, but to go and to speak to somebody different. We have prayer ministry uh, at the end of our service at the front of the church. So we ask people to move quickly into the hall or out of the sanctuary. If you want to talk, the vestibule is there. That's not a problem. But people maybe want to come and pray at the front of the church. I will not be standing at the door today because I'm going to preach and the poor people of Khalid will have to listen to me for the next hour from 12 o'clock. So I'll be just moving straight away after the service this morning. Let's sing to God's praise.
And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be with us all now and forevermore. Amen.